We now have presentations by partners in the Creating Spaces, Preserving Places, Thurston Regional Sustainability Plan. And we will start out with a presentation by Jeff Gadman, Lacey City Council member, and Kathy McCormick, uh, Thurston Regional Planning Council, regarding the plan and its development. We will then have a panel of partners to talk about their entity's implementation of the plan and some of the challenges. Jeff Gadman is a Lacey City Council member since February 2011 and has been the Lacey representative to the Sustainable Thurston Regional Planning efforts since the beginning. In addition, he has been employed with the Thurston County Assessor's Office for 27 years, giving him a unique insight into how zoning laws and regulations affect citizens and the investors that shape our community growth. Jeff is excited about the Creating Spaces, Preserving Places, Thurston Regional Sustainability Plan for its balanced approach to people, a vibrant economy, and a healthy environment. Hi, I'm Jeff Gadman, Lacey City Council member, and for the past three years, I've been sitting with a group of your friends and neighbors, elected officials, private business owners, create what's called Creating Places, Preserving Spaces, which is a sustainable development plan for Thurston County. Over a thousand communities applied for a HUD grant to be able to study this. Thurston County was one of the lucky 45 chosen to be able to do this. One of the first challenges we had as a group was coming up with a definition of sustainable. Most of us had a picture in our mind, but we needed to actually articulate it and it needed to be the guiding definition of what we were doing for the past three years. So what we came up with was a sustainable community will enhance quality of life, foster economic vitality, and protect the environment while balancing our needs today with those of future residents. It was very important for us to make sure that while sustainability preserved, preserves the environment, that it also creates an economic vitality so that we can draw new businesses in, draw new residents, and keep our education levels high. Some people might ask, why a regional plan? Well, each jurisdiction going off on its own cre can create several different outcomes in the county. And we've got to remember, there's a lot of regional services that cost us all more money if somebody makes a decision to make the system more expensive. Power company is regional. The stormwater is regional. The uh, uh, lot is regional and so the roads are regional and we need to try and work as a region for a sustainable plan because it's going to be cheaper and smarter in the long run for all of us. One of our challenges that we were first presented was we realized that the direction we were going was going to result in a lot of undesirable outcomes which we'll get to in a minute. So while achieving our definition of sustainability, what we realized we needed is more compact form of land use. We need to put an emphasis on place making and job creation. And we need to have efficient use of our resources such as water and electricity. <clears throat> These things are necessary no matter the growth rate. So continuing as we are right now would result by 2035 would result in losing 32% of our farmlands. That's over 15,000 acres in Thurston County. It results in losing 10% of our forest lands. That's over 19,000 acres. It would have sent 13% of our growth into the rural areas, creating more sprawl and the need for more expensive infrastructure such as roads, water, sewer, and electrical grids. Low density growth patterns that are difficult to serve with infrastructure and services put a real strain on already strained resources and shrinking government budgets. Sprawl makes it difficult to attract enough growth to our city centers to attract more businesses, to make the places real vibrant to live in. There would be concerns over water availability, which also uh, brings concerns about water quality. You know, water is a finite resource we know that more water rights have been given than there is water available. The State Department of Ecology is trying to rein that in now. Then along with that goes water quality concerns. 
the more growth you have, the more spread out growth is, the harder it is to manage stormwater, the harder it is to maintain the infrastructure to get you a nice clean glass of water. Then there's concerns over increased energy use and the ability to meet the state's vehicle miles traveled requirements. <clears throat> the farther out growth goes, the farther out we've got to spread our, our energy grid, the more expensive that is to make, build and maintain. But it also means we've got to make more streets, we've got to make more uh, vehicle lanes. All of that is expensive and it really puts a strain on government, but it also adds to the cost of doing business and the cost of building a house in the area. So one of the things that the Sustainable Thurston Group did is we highlighted a disconnect between visions and reality that are likely to occur. We recognize that land use and transportation are the backbones of our communities. If we get those two things right, everything else relating to sustainability comes together. So what we did in phase one is we decided we needed to connect, create, and communicate. What the Sustainability Task Force started with were white papers that were done in 12 different disciplines that had to do with school, transportation, transportation, energy, wastewater, solid waste, um, jobs, and the economy. And that was what we had to start with to try and get start to get our hands around what does sustainability mean and how do we achieve it. Part of the public outreach that we did uh, we ended up with 180 people participated on topic panels, those are the white papers, producing 12 white papers. We mailed 110,000 postcards asking for input. The workshops we had in the spring of 2012 drew 342 participants, 37 table discussions. We had 39 online participants. We also received 1,200 survey responses, and Washington State University helped us to tally those results and interpret those results. And we currently have 1,300 people, over 1,300 people on our email list. It's just fantastic what this community has done as far as participating in this process for us. One of the things that the Sustainability Task Force held near and dear is that community participation and making sure public input was effective was very, very important to us. We did not want this to occur in a bubble. <clears throat> so in phase one, we looked at land use, transportation, climate change, the economy, energy, local food systems, public safety, health and human services, water infrastructure, solid waste, water quality, health and human services, and schools and transportation. These were the topics of the white papers that we studied. And the white papers were put together by experts and lay people from the community that were interested in studying where we're at now and how can we get to a sustainable future. Then in phase two, we took the results of phase one, took the results of the public outreach forums, took the results of the survey, and said, okay, here's what people want Here's what sustainability means. Now let's see if we can put those two things together into a coherent plan. So we identified goals and actions that we wanted to achieve. We explored future land use outcomes, exploring several different op options under existing plans and with three alternative scenarios, bold, uh, moderate, and mighty scenarios, uh, making challenging ourselves and TRPC to come up with predicted outcomes. We added new tools to traditional public outreach to reach a broader and more diverse public. So in phase three is where we actually drew up the draft plan that you're going to be presented tonight. As you can see, we've got the wheel here that um, shows you how everything is connected and that is in the uh, plan itself, explained in the plan itself. So one of the things that we feel like we achieved was bold vision with bold goals and targets into a preferred land use scenario, 300 actions with leads, timelines, and partners. Now it's important to note 
that one of the overriding concerns of the sustainable task force was that each jurisdiction maintain its autonomy. This is not something that's going to be forced down anybody's throat. However, it gives a good plan and good guidelines. If we want a sustainable future, it would be wise for each jurisdiction to adopt this. Thank you. Kathy McCormick is a senior planner with the Thurston Regional Planning Council. For the last 28 years, she has experienced the challenges and joys of working with jurisdictions throughout the region on the integration of land use and transportation policy, housing, community development and redevelopment planning, and trip reduction, including a Healthy Kids Safe Streets Action Plan and an interactive comprehensive plan, education programs for students and adults. Most recently, she served as one of the lead planners facilitating the Sustainable Thirsting Community Conversation. Kathy is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. So now we'll have um, Kathy McCormick come up and continue the presentation. Good evening. Thank you, Jeff. Let's talk about this um, path forward. We've had this incredible, as Jeff said, incredible opportunity in this region to have this community conversation that has really helped us to define what does sustainability mean for the Thurston region, the bold vision, the goals and actions. Um, and so, as we like to say, this, is, this plan is not the end of the conversation, but it's really the beginning. Because from the beginning, policymakers and residents wanted to be involved, but they wanted to this plan to lead to action. So uh, before we get into that and you hear from the panelists about implementation, let's go through quickly some of the more in more depth, some of the elements of the plan. So in terms of underlying elements, as Jeff said, the bottom line is, as we found out in our analysis, is, is really our land use, our future land use. And these first two are really key. And the first one is about focusing on and or enhancing walkable city and town centers. For us, this is both our major North County centers as well as our cities and towns in the South County and a couple of places too. And what we've discovered is, is that in our analysis and in our discussions, is folks are really interested in those places becoming vital, more vital than they are now. And um, in taking a look at them, we realize how many opportunities are to uh, really maximize um, activities, more housing, more commerce in those areas and making the goods and services there more accessible to more people. Secondly, transitioning our auto-oriented um, transit corridors. This really relates to our North County areas. And we were lucky enough to get an additional grant and do in, in tandem with the Sustainable Thurston discussions over the last couple of years, uh, there have been some demonstration projects on our corridors. And uh, these are really uh, master plans that have identified incredible opportunities around some in those corridors for some nodes of development to occur um, and really provide some, an opportunity to provide some, eventually some additional housing and services um, and really also to maximize the investment that we have already made in transit. We have an incredible transit system for uh, the density that we have and for the population that we have and we want to maximize use of that. In these master plans, we've also learned so much about what we can do to create really safe and accessible corridors and really attractive places uh, that can really serve the population better. Um, another major element is really, of course, to um, um, create more opportunities for jobs, especially focusing on those innovative and creative jobs um, and to locate as many of those jobs as we can in activity centers so that they too can help build the vitality and we can take advantage of the infrastructure investment that has already been made in those areas. Increasing the range of choices of housing. Here again, um, this is really all about choice. In this area, when you think about it, we have a pretty narrow range 
of opportunities and choices for people in terms of housing type and in terms of location. And um, we know our demographics are changing and that we've got to start to really focus on giving folks um, who would like to live in activity centers or closer to goods and services or folks who need to because they can't uh, afford to own multiple cars to make their day-to-day -day lives work. We need to rethink our low density residential only zones and this really speaks I think to many of our neighborhoods. There's a lot of um, opportunities there to increase uh, different types of housing um, and hopefully even in some places and in some neighborhoods adding enough rooftops to support some close by services or destinations in neighborhoods and we heard a lot from folks in our process that they would love to have uh, a coffee shop or a bakery or some kind of destination um, and in some places it can even be more than that depending on the densities that we achieve. Using the remaining urban land supply more efficiently, that really is about, is also about how do we maximize the investment we've already made. You'll hear time and time again, I think uh, Miranda um, uh, expressed that, our jurisdictions are struggling to maintain the infrastructure we have. We have made huge investments in that infrastructure. How do we take advantage and maximize the use of that? How do we begin to get the return on investment that has already been made, let alone the maintenance costs for each mile of the roadway and the rest of the infrastructure. Taking into account private property rights, we have a lot of fear out there about this issue. The Growth Management Act has got 14 goals. One of those goals is protection of private property rights. And this really, um, this goal serves to make clear the fact that in this country we have very strong federal and in the state we have strong land use laws that protect private property rights. And everything that jurisdictions will do will operate within, within those laws. Taking steps to, perform, to support really uh, farm and rural economies as well as rural character. We're gonna need to rethink and re-examine rural zoning and also take a look at every viable tool that's out there that can serve as an incentive, including things like purchase and, and transfer of development rights. So what do we get um, if we work to continue to work together as partners, continue this conversation, and support taking action? Well, one of the things we get, we were talking about infrastructure, is compared to our existing plans, we estimate that we can save $1.6 billion in infrastructure that would not be built because focusing growth doesn't require as much infrastructure to support it. And this doesn't even address the huge amounts of money, and our jurisdictions can tell you what that is, um, to maintain that infrastructure year after year after year. Our preferred land use scenario, or the scenario, the land use that Sustainable Thurston is built upon, also results in this, a whole range of uh, what we see as benefits and that begin to achieve some of the goals that we heard that folks want to achieve for the future of the region. 16% reduction in, in uh, vehicle miles traveled, and that's based on land use changes alone. 33% reduction in land consumption, 21% decrease in total residential water consumption, and that's residential alone. 11% decrease in residential energy consumption, no net loss of forest and farmlands, and really substantial reductions in the new impervious surface areas and protected and sensitive stream basins. One of the main things we heard from the beginning in our surveys, and that hasn't changed, is folks are really concerned about the health of Puget Sound. And we know how important this protection of um, and, and trying to keep from adding uh, pervious area to our rural areas, especially in some basins, um, how important that's going to be to achieve that goal. <coughs> so um, how do we make this happen? Where do we start? Um, it's pretty daunting. Jeff talked about um, the 
we've got the definition, we've got the bold vision, we've got um, this plan, it really embodies 40 plus goals and 300 actions that address that full range of, of quality of life topics and those can be addressed over time. There are folks in our community that that's their job day to day um, is to deal with those issues and we now have a path forward. We dug deeply. We can be, we, if you look at the plan, it's a working document. But the question is, is how do we track and measure how we're doing? And to do that, the plan also identifies 12 priority goals that can lead us towards sustainability. And we'll run through these quickly, but if you think about them holistically, think about them together, that if we track these and measure them over time, they will tell us, they will be a good gauge for telling us how well we're doing in achieving these, the sustainability that is described. <clears throat> so you can see the first two are related again back to land use, uh, creating those vibrant centers, corridors, and neighborhoods. Also um, preserving the flip side of that is preserving environmentally sensitive lands, farmlands, forest lands, prairies, etc. Each one of these priority goals has a target and actually if you look at the plan it has a first action step. So we know where actually know what we need to do even to take the first step. <clears throat> Creating a robust economy, protecting and improving water quality, plan and acting toward zero waste in the region. We'll be hearing the mantra of reduce, reuse and recycle um, over the years and continue, needing to continue to educate ourselves and our community about how to do that and support that happening uh, through our policies. Ensuring residents have the resource to meet their daily needs. This is really about uh, reducing the percentage of households in our community that struggle to meet their daily needs. Um, safe and warm housing, food, transportation, and we'll track that over time. Supporting local food systems. We know, we've learned in this process, um, how much our local food systems really contribute to our economy. And not only that, we've learned so much about how our food systems contribute to our local resilience and also how they can contribute to local and personal health. Our region's water supply, um, Miranda address that and we need that to sustain people over time as well as the environment. Moving toward a carbon neutral community, uh, uh, addressing both greenhouse gas reductions and vehicle miles traveled per capita, we'll be tracking that. Maintaining air quality standards of course and really making progress toward sustainability is going to take motivated and informed leaders and citizens. And that's going to be an ongoing process and will be really important um, as we move forward. And really, finally, it's our regional, local, and household decisions that will really make a difference and move us um, to the vision that's been described. So in a minute, we're going to move to our panelists. And these are folks who will be heavily involved in this ongoing community conversation about sustainability. Um, but the thing we need to remember to remind ourselves, especially for those of us in the Thurston region, this isn't necessarily going to be easy. We know that money is tight. We're going to have to continue to be creative. But we also have learned what we have to lose that Jeff talked about and what we have to gain. And the fact that taking steps and taking action toward this vision will not only save us money and return investment on the investments in, that we've already made, um, but it is just really a smart thing to do for our future. The Thurston Regional Planning Council has made moving forward an action on sustainable Thurston a priority. So they intend to be a partner, continue to be a partner with all the jurisdictions in the region. This project, I think, has modeled partnership and how much can be accomplished in a region by pulling public, private, and nonprofit folks together. 
and really working closely um, and listening to one another and really asking tough questions and making some tough decisions and creating a bold vision that really came out of the process. So the train is sustainable. Thurston train is really left the station. And I think some of what you're going to hear from the panelists is the fact that um, you're going to hear many things that have already begun, even though the plan is just um, this first stage of, the, of our sustainable Thurston planning is just coming to an end, um, um, probably in December. So with that, um, Heather, I'm going to turn this back over to you so you can introduce our panelists. So now we will have a panel of four folks representing um, some of the entities that partnered on this plan and their thoughts about implementation and some of the challenges. They are Dennis McVeigh with the City of Rainier, Michael Cade with the Thurston Economic Development Council, Scott Clark with Thurston County, and John Doan with the City of Tumwater. Dennis McVeigh is a council member at the City of Rainier here in Thurston County. He served as a member and chairman of the Rainier Planning Commission as a city council member and mayor pro tempore. He is the city's representative to the Thurston Regional Planning Council um, and served as chair of that body for two terms. He's also the representative to the Thurston County Home Consortium and he was the chair and still is of the Sustainable Thurston Task Force. Dennis is now retired and res has resided in Rainier with his wife Gloria for 21 years. Please welcome De Dennis. Thank you, Heather, and again, thank everybody for coming. Well, good evening. It, it was my privilege to serve as chair of the Thurst Sustainable Thurston Task Force for the th last three years. It was a dynamic and energetic group of over 300 engaged citizens and organizations. I wish to reemphasize that the Thurston Region Sustainability Plan, titled Creating Places and Preserving Spaces, is a menu of things a jurisdiction may do for sustainability and is in no way regulatory in nature. The things that a small city or town may accomplish can differ greatly from what a large jurisdiction may do. It all comes down to need, ability, and of course financing. Some of the things that the city of Rainier is considering or is already doing are revising our zoning and building codes to su support sustainability. An example, we have recently added a provision that new subdivisions must cluster homes along one edge of the property because we're on septics, so that when we, in the future, when we actually have sewers, we can then infill to the maximum capacity of that property. In addition, we're also going to allow accessory dwellings on lots that are already built out to help with infill. We continue to work toward a safer and more walkable city center with emphasis on safe routes to schools and businesses. We're also updating plans to add connectivity between neighborhoods and streets. Sometimes that's tough when your main street is a state highway. Currently, we have some grad, uh, senior students from St. Martin's, engineering students, that are working with us and our planner from TRPC to come up with a plan for a town center more walkable areas and additional parking, and we're really looking forward to that product. <clears throat> we have entered into an agreement with Thurston County to construct youth athletic fields, particularly soccer fields, on county trail property, which runs through Rainier from city limit to city limit. We think that active young people are healthy young people, which contributes to a sustainable lifestyle. The city is in support of steady, South Thurston Economic Development Initiative, which includes Yelm, Rainier, Tenino, Dakota, Rochester, and Grand Mound, in conjunction with the Thurston Economic Development Council. We're also participating in the Highway 507 Corridor Study, which includes Bucota, Tenino, Rainier, and Yelm, since Highway 7 is all of our main streets. And that is in conjunction with the Thurston Regional Planning Council. We believe these two actions will enhance economic development in, for Rainier and for the surrounding area. 
The city will continue to support the Rainier Community Garden, which is sponsored by the Rainier School District and local community organizations. It produces several hundred pounds of fresh local produce yearly, which we provide to the community and the food bank. We also encourage other organizations and individuals to grow and produce their own produce in the city, and we're allowed to raise chickens, eggs, rabbits, etc., to support themselves. The city is working to conserve our water and use it wisely and to protecting our aquifer. We are promulgating regulations to be in place on the use of reclaimed water in anticipation of sewers. We are working to reduce electrical and natural gas usage through retrofits of fixtures, appliances, insulation, and window upgrades. We also allow and encourage the use of solar panels on homes and businesses. The city is trying to work with residents and businesses to decrease the waste stream generated within the city to help with landfill and solid waste <coughs> issues. And we're working to preserve the almost 200 acres of long-term forest lands that are within city limits, which helps with water filtration and air quality. As time and opportunity permit, the city of Rainier will continue to look for new and innovative ways to enhance the city's sustainability in support of the Thurston Regional Goals. And thank you very much for your interest in sustainability. Thank you, Councilmember McVeigh. So that was a perspective from a smaller jurisdiction in the county on how to implement the plan. And now we'll hear from Michael Cade, who's been the Executive Director of the Economic Development Council of Thurston County since January 2004. The EDC is a private nonprofit agency dedicated to creating a vital and sustainable co economy throughout the county that supports the livelihood and values of its residents. Previously, Michael was the Vice President for the Snohomish County EDC from 1992 to 2003. His 20-year career has primarily been focused on the recruitment of investment into the community and the retention of companies, and working on numerous community-based community development task forces emphasizing the creation of quality communities. Michael currently sits on the Board of Directors of the Thurston County Chamber of Commerce, the Pacific Mountain Workforce Development Council, Morningside, and the Washington State Arts Commission. Please welcome Michael Cade. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and the welcome. Um, just a point of privilege by the speaker here, I do want to just take a moment and thank the Thurston Regional Planning Council for the opportunity to partner. Um, economic development is not a, a, a game that's played by itself. We've tried to redefine economic development and we found a great partner in the Thurston Regional Planning Council and some of the work that we're doing and will continue to do in the next 20 years, I believe, even though you know, I'm 50 now, so in 20 years I'll be 70, even though I probably won't be there, will be set by the course of actions that are taken today with the uh, partnership with the TRPC. So a word of thanks and, and really it was a acknowledgement of the good planning efforts there, but thank you very much to be invited to the table. It's always nice. I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the economic panel that we undertook and the work that was uh, developed through that economic <coughs> development panel. Talk about sustainability. And then I want to address a little bit about implementation elements of those actions and how we took some of those elements and started to create little actions already. And even though it's been a short period of time, we have really taken them a bit hard into some of these ideas, started to put them into play. And then I want to provide examples of how the panel's work guides our overall work. Talk a little bit about the regional partnership that we've started to develop. And then I want to wrap it up with a core set of precepts that uh, my team takes very, very seriously and it guides our actions as we start to undertake different partnerships and different roles. This, is, uh, this chart is a little bit daunting, actually, when you start thinking about it, when you drill down. And I don't know if you have a copy of it in your, in your handouts, but certainly talk to me afterwards, and I'll get it to you if you don't have it. But if you look at that chart, uh, we really kind of start talking about spheres of influence. And at first we call it a solar system, and then we call it a variety of different things and planets of influence. And then we kind of just decided to stay with the simple thing of this is spheres of influence. <clears throat> when you start talking about economic development, there's a lot of things that that, that, that econ, economic developers do. So we can't be everything for everybody. And so let's talk about what has the most impact upon the three things that we've already talked about, social, economic, and the environment. 
if we're really going to be serious about a sustainable economy, we really have to understand the connection and the nexus between each one of these elements as the actions that we take. And so what we started to do is understand how they work. And when I presented this to the Thurston Regional Planning Council and the uh, sustainability panel, we actually decided to actually create points of connections between all these elements. After about 300 lines on this map, we decided it was a bunch of garbage because, again, you can't be everything for everybody, but the point is that it's related. And so if you don't have a progressive education system, you certainly don't have an innovative economy. If you don't have an innovative economy, you certainly are not t building strong revenue base for your municipalities to do good things. And so we decided to kind of gear down a little bit and understand what are the six basic elements that we can really focus on. And so that really guides a lot of the work that we're starting to do. Um, a little bit about kind of the, the, the next slide here is really about, I shouldn't have titled this implementation elements. I should have called it implementation elevators. How do we elevate economic development to activities? Um, it's an art form. You know, economic development is, is not necessarily just a, a practice, but it's an art form. So how do you do it and why do you do it? And so these are the things that we really focus on. Regional partnerships. It's easy to say. It's tough to put in practice. Um, last counter, we at my organization have 55 different partnerships that we've cultivated throughout the region. Not necessarily just Thurston, but also across the border. Um, don't necessarily turn into a, a dragon when I cross the Nisqually River, and I certainly don't turn into a pumpkin when I go south of uh, Grand Mound. But the idea is that you better have regional partnerships. You better understand that they exist, and you better understand that you want to put them in your back pocket and walk around with them. And the idea is that workforce education is a, is a critical component. It's a pillar. Understand it. Figure out how it relates to innovative economies. And then when you start talking about local capacity and identification of major employment commercial clusters, that's the data piece kind of dig into the data. Economic development is a kind of a backyard barbecue sport. You get your knees dirty and start kind of throwing it around because you'll find that you better understand where the data comes from and you better understand what it means. And that's really kind of the elements that we took from this slide. Um, we decided that, hey, we actually have some other things, so let's find out what the data is and take on to those, those economic employment clusters. This is a, a, a great example of how do you break the rule of develop a PowerPoint slides. It's what's the rule, three to five points <laughs> per slide? Well, there's about 20 of them on here. Um, Dennis mentioned the STEADY, South Thurston Economic Development Initiative. And this is um, something that I am going to go to my grave not taking credit for because I don't think it's important to take credit for it. But if they put on my headstone that uh, he uh, was part of STEADY, that would be fine. Um, because it really is the way to organize and leverage resources in a rural community together to do something that the community needs. It's not the point of Michael Cade coming into a community and saying, you need to do this to become a resilient community. It's about engaging the community to understand what those resources are to become engaged with me and how do I start creating those ideas to bring them to them. So, you know, I can sit in my office, which is across the street here, and say, why doesn't, why doesn't the phone ring? Well. You know, the phone doesn't ring because people know I'm there. So we better go out and engage ourselves. It's that backyard barbecue sport idea again. The idea is a steady is to identify and implement strategic efforts that could meet South County's economic and community development goals. Please take a look at that word, could meet South County's needs. The idea is that we're going to give it a shot. And the idea is that we don't know what we're going to end up with, but we know we need to start with those partnerships that are identified up above. The other thing that we're starting to do is a regional, we call it a re regional innovation partnership model. And this is something that's very cool. Um, there's a nice article in the, the Olympian the other day, the local newspaper, about um, some of the things that uh, they're doing up in Tacoma. And I kind of wish our hometown newspaper would give us a little bit of credit about doing some of the stuff here because the cities and the college, we have blessed with three higher ed institutions, Evergreen State uh, College, uh, St. Martin's University, which is next door to this campus, as well as South Puget Sound Community College. I want to establish a South Sound Entrepreneur Center at their new campus here in Lacey. The idea is that necessarily just to create a place for folks to get trained. But let's look at the three precepts that people go into education. They go into education to get direct employment. They go into education to get a matriculation and or certification. And or they go into become entrepreneurs and work within a job community. So if we can create an environment where folks can walk into a place and get that action and get that verve, we've been, we've been successful. That is sustainability because what you're doing is you're building an economic ecosystem within the environment that you live in. You're not importing those new jobs and you're not importing a variety of different resources. 
what you're doing is you're maximizing the folks that grew up here and chose to live here and invest here. And so that, that truly is a, something that's we're very, very excited about. This is my uh, from order comes chaos slide. Um, but when you start boiling it down to what is it that we do in Thurston County, we do a lot of different things. But we now know through data analysis and we actually can uh, find out these connections between these different clusters of activities, everything from uh, food to life sciences to wood. We know that each one is dependent upon each other in some sort of weird way. If you're looking in the back row and you see these blue and green dots, think of in food, you have core industries and then you have the green, the, the green eye, which is an input, industrial input, and then you have processors and then you have the transportation. If you take out one of these channels, all of a sudden you have a diminished food sector. If you build up a sector, if you build up this channel that goes from wood manufacturing, that goes to, that supports the food manufacturing, all of a sudden you have a stronger, robust food. So we have choices to make in all of our lives. And so if we choose to focus on some of these activities that go in here, we know that it impacts tourism, recreation, wood manufacturing, IT telecom, and chemicals and plastics product, products manufacturing. And I'm not talking about petrochemical products manufacturing. I'm talking about stuff that maybe is, uh, is a little bit more home-based than that. So um, life science is an interesting one, and I'm kind of devi deviating. I'm now into my rotary speech. Um, but when you start talking about life sciences, you start thinking about the quality of life that we have here. We have a growing life sciences system here. Ten years it didn't exist in Thurston County. It just, it just didn't show up. And so why is all of a sudden one of our six major clusters? It's there because some folks have decided to stay here and grow their companies here. It's R&D. And they take advantage of these IT telecom. We're blessed with resources. And so if we can get folks to take advantage of what exists here, we know that we can grow some very significant stuff. Conversely, what's the other question you need to ask yourselves is what's not on the chart? So we go back to the three, three precepts of uh, economic social environment. Is there a a sixth or seventh blob out there that we need to understand. We import a lot of stuff, and so we now know how much import elements or goods are imported into our community. We can start winnowing a strategy, so we to reducing those imports, maybe we can produce those here. Foods is a very large thing, so we have food that can, maybe we can uh, not replace uh, uh, corn sweetener or whatever it is, but maybe you grow it out of potatoes, I don't know. Uh, but maybe we could do it here. But that's the idea that this is the kind of data that we now have access to. The precepts, um, this is kind of, I really like this slide actually. Um, when you start looking at some of what goes behind that thing, a sustainable economy requires collaboration, commitment, and agreement. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, commitment that, that yeah. Um, you have to have folks that are willing to check their kind of agendas at the door and make sure that they're focused on that long-term agenda of quality communities. We're not in it for the short hit. We're in it for the long term. We want a quality job. We want a quality environment to create and grow that environment. Sustainable economy requires a balanced approach. Win, win, win. That's those three things. Um, and then the last one I'm going to do, because I'm running out of time here, and I think we, we kind of know what those middle ones are, but the last one is when done correctly, we can produce the future we plan for, not the one we get if we don't goes back to the idea that back, backyard barbecue sport of economic development. It's interchangeable with community development. If you're gonna build a quality community, you're gonna get your knees dirty, you're gonna get your elbows dirty, and, but you're gonna produce the fruit that you're gonna bear, bear, that you're going to reap the benefits of for your children and their children, and you're gonna leave a legacy of quality economy. So with that, I'm, I'm done, and uh, look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is Scott Clark. He's the Thurston County Planning Director. Scott, <coughs> first and foremost, is a parent and grandparent with four kids and three grandkids. His professional <coughs> career is a mixture of military with 26 years in six foreign countries, including a Bronze Star for service in Iraq and public service. Scott served as code enforcement officer and then research analyst at the City of Olympia where he was instrumental in developing the first set of low impact development standards in the state of Washington. <coughs> Scott then joined Thurston County Public Works Department as a utility planner where he developed plans for the county water, sewer, solid waste, 
and stormwater utilities. Scott has served as the county planning director since 2008, leading the planning department through the county's first update of the critical areas ordinance in 17 years. The adoption of growth management impact fees and the adoption of a health chapter in the county's comprehensive plan. The planning department is currently developing an interim permitting strategy and a habitat conservation plan for threatened, endangered, and sensitive prairie habitat and species. The update to the shoreline management plan as well as the science to local policy project which seeks to protect watershed health through better land use practices and zoning. Please welcome Scott. Thank you, thank you very much, Heather. Um, I'm glad to see uh, so many of the planning commissioners show up because your work is extremely critical and it's going to be very difficult in these times of constrained resources, of climate change, and different ways of how we think about living on planet Earth, uh, particularly this sustainability topic. Thurston County has been active in sustainability long before the sustainability plan came along. Uh, I'll give you some examples. We did increase the amount of long-term agricultural acreage by 2,000 acres in the past few years, so we're up to roughly 14,000 acres in, of long-term ag lands being zoned that way. Uh, we passed an agricultural tourism overlay in 2013. What that does is encourages agricultural tourism primarily in areas of South Thurston County along Highway 507. Uh, the intent there is to highlight our farming in the county, bring tourists in so they're buying local products, and to stimulate the economy of South Thurston County. Uh, you'll see that continue to grow as we put signs on the byway, announcing the byway, and hopefully we'll see festivals and other things kind of spring up around that. We amended the development code in 2012 uh, to allow for relax standards to uh, be able to construct farm stands. So hopefully we'll see more farm stands go up in a rural county, again, stimulating the economy. The county's been active in securing easements on agricultural lands through our Conservation Futures Program. Over the past few years, we've secured easements on the Black River Ranch, the Helsing Farm, and most recently, the Weens Farm. So those lands now are protected in perpetuity to be farming, and they're currently being used to train, in some cases, the next generation of farmers. We've currently got four to 800,000 set aside for prairie and agricultural lands easements because what we're finding is prairie habitat, particularly managed grazing, goes a long way towards promoting prairie species, prairie plants, and prairie animals. So we've been busy. Uh, and then at one point in time, I, I turned away, said we should probably look at doing something that Kathy and Dina Tabbitt and others came up with called Sustainable Thurston. Then we went off and did the Critical Areas Ordinance, and I turned around and said, we've got something else for you to work on now. So here we are again. So how are we gonna do this? Uh, how are we gonna implement sustainable Thurston? I told Mike McCormick earlier tonight we're gonna do it using baling wire and bubble gum. And, and the reason why is this. We're required to update our comprehensive plan in 2016. Uh, presently, there's a pretty severe shortage of Growth Management Act funding through the Growth Management Grant Program to do that kind of update. If there's any money, we're thinking it's going to be roughly $50,000 a year for the two-year update process. That's only about $250,000 to $300,000 short of what you actually need to do that countywide giant process with an open and continuous public outreach you're supposed to have. Because when you do one of these, as they've seen, it's the public wants to come talk to you about it. And they have things they want you to do, and they have stuff they want you to listen to. They're going to care very loudly sometimes, and it's going to take your time to listen to what they're saying. and digest it and then turn that into action. So it takes money to do that. So we're gonna to have to be created how we accomplish our comprehensive plan updates and incorporate the appropriate elements of sustainable Thurston into it. So any place we can see a funding nexus with a state grant, a federal grant, or a nonprofit or opportunity, we're gonna to have to take that opportunity and make it happen because there's not a state mechanism to do it other than the GAMA funding grants and those have been severely constrained. So how are we doing some of this right now? Well, as, as mentioned in the intro there, we've got a, what's called a Section 6 Habitat Conservation Planning Grant. And what the purpose of a Habitat Conservation Plan is, is to allow you to protect endangered species and those habitats while assuring for long-term economic development in areas where it's responsible. Two goals that Congress set aside. So we got roughly a $3 million grant over a period of years to do that. We're working on that now. We're working on it with our interjurisdictional partners, City of Tumwater, um, the good Mayor McVeigh is involved in this. And the idea here is to establish areas where you can do economic development, 
that are not going to be encroached upon by these species and vice versa. So both sides of the house have a long-term certainty. These permits last 30 or 50 years. So as you saw, one of the key goals of sustainable thurston is protecting rural lands, protecting rural habitats. Well, we've got funding. We'll be working on doing that. We'll be able to incorporate some of sustainable thurston that way. We've also got the National, National Estuary Pro, uh, Program Grant uh, for science to local policy. So one of the goals in uh, sustainability was to protect the waters of Puget Sound. What the science to local policy grant looks like is what are the sensitive basins uh, that are at risk of becoming uh, significantly degraded and, for example, the Deschutes River watershed. What kind of land use and zoning do you need to apply to protect the aquatic habitat, the aquatic species, and the water quality? So we have that grant. That's going to come up with some land use and zoning proposals, and that's another way of implementing this. We're currently working on what's called the Scatter Creek uh, Aquifer Septic Management System, which is down in South County. For those of you familiar with South County, the soils down there are very, very porous. What hits the ground today, you'll drink tomorrow. So if you put a lot of intense development and commercial industrial use down there, you're going to drink that stuff. So we're looking at what can actually go down there that's going to allow for the residents that currently live there have safe drinking water, to see agricultural practices that are safe, and what things should not go down there. So you'll probably see land use and zoning recommendations come out of that. The other thing that we just embarked on is what's called the Voluntary Stewardship Program. This is a grant from the Washington State uh, Conservation Commission. Its intent is to work with environmental groups, the tribes, and the agricultural community to determine what the appropriate agricultural regulations are when you're dealing with critical areas and sensitive areas. It's going to be a challenging project, and hopefully they'll come out of something where they can say we can do this kind of farming here without impacting the uh, water resources and get everyone to buy into that, which has been a challenge in Washington State. Of course, counties are required to plan by GMA with their interjurisdictional partners. So this is going to be, as you saw in Sustainable Thurston, you're looking to increase densities in your urban areas to have walkable, livable areas where you can have business close to where you work, where your transportation system doesn't stretch across the entire county. That means the cities are going to be looking for ways to accept more density. When you go from taking 13% of your future growth from going into the county to shifting that down to only five, the rest of that goes into the cities. We'll be having to work very close with our, our jurisdictional partners to figure out how that's going to work. Hopefully, John is going to be willing to pay for most of that work. <laughs> I'll take that as... As long as you take most of the gophers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got good enough happening. The reason I talk about this is, again, we have to be opportunistic right now. As you've been reading the papers, we're going to cut another six to nine million dollars out of the county budget. We'll probably start doing that again in another 24 months. When you have a one percent property tax cap and the cost of living increases by roughly three percent a year, the math goes bad quickly. That's our reality. So uh, they asked me what the obstacles are to uh, sustainable thirst. And one is funding. I've talked briefly about that. Public communications and perception, and then a siege mentality. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those. I've already talked some about the funding, but I do want to talk about, at some point in time, there has to be a discussion in the legislature, which perhaps you can encourage, that if you're going to plan for walkable, energy-efficient, vibrant communities with a healthy economic base, healthy rural areas, and open spaces, you're going to have to fund the planning. $50,000 pays for a quarter of a planner for part of a year. That's the reality. <clears throat> so you may want to talk to your local legislatures about what they need to do about that. Beyond the GMA grant funds, counties are strapped. We don't have the same tax base and tax revenue sources that cities do. We're broke. The next thing is, is public perception. And, and elected officials, citizen communities, and planning staffs need to be at all times factual across the spectrum of today's communication tools. Your sustainable planning efforts should put considerable time and energy into developing their public outreach and stakeholder strategies. In many cases, our citizens simply haven't heard an issue in context. Once you put it in context, they can turn around and provide you informed input. When you start your efforts, consider how you're going to communicate with your local radio, newspaper, and editorial boards, and then do that. Do it early, do it often, do it factually. Stay in touch with these people. They're looking for a story. If you don't give them the factual story, they'll make one. 
and then you'll be responding to it for a long, long time. The media and communications is not to be avoided. They're not your enemy. It's their job, and it's also your job to communicate to them. Think about how you're going to use social media, YouTube, and your website to inform the public of events and new information. Who's going to monitor your communication strategy to see if it's working? Are you getting the feedback that you would expect to hear from the depth and the breadth of your proposals? If you're proposing big stuff, you should be getting feedback. If not, you're not communicating, especially in this community. They're going to want to talk to you. Figure out how you're going to respond to misinformation, intentional and otherwise. Winston Churchill said a lie gets halfway around the world before, you can get your, before the truth can get its pants on. That was 45 years ago. Today, a lie goes around the world four or five times before the truth manages to get out there. So have a plan for how you're going to handle misinformation, whether it's a civil face-to-face -face conversation with somebody that's just saying something that's incorrect because they haven't heard the facts or they haven't read up on it. Do that. Take that time to talk to that individual. If it's intentional misinformation, you're going to need to clarify this, and you may need to contact your local radio station do a letter to the editor, postings on social media, or preferably all of, all, all of the above. If you don't take charge of communicating your message and making sure the facts get out there, other people will take charge of communicating the message, and it won't be the facts, or it will be a different set of facts from a different perspective, and you'll be responding to that. And it will put the entire legitimate public process at risk. And that's what you're in charge of doing as planning commissioners, is making sure the public process gets done, all angles get considered, and then you come up with a recommendation that's based on fact, science, and your best professional judgment. That's what you're supposed to do. If you're hearing noise, decipher it. Finally, uh, let me see, what were the other obstacles? I, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about in the county itself. Um, Thurston County, the rural county, is probably suffering from fatigue at this point. We're, if you remember, we had a rural rezoning a few years ago. We downzoned a lot of people at that time. People that had expectations when they bought that land at one to one, one to five, that at some point in time they're going to be able to develop that, sell it or whatever, and get a return on their investment. We rezoned those people. Then we came back down for the critical areas ordinance update. Now we've got three endangered species, and we've got a habitat conservation plan, and now we have sustainable thirsting. Does that change the realities that things are going to have to be done to protect species, to protect watersheds, to protect drinking water, to ensure you have farmlands? No. But I do want to leave you with people have gone through this already. And not all of them see it as beneficial. They see it as a huge burden. And that's where that communication comes in again. Because you will get the angry phone call like I got today, whereas what is this about this plan where it's being all the zoning and land use is changing and we even haven't even had any input so it took time to listen to that and say, yes, there is a sustainable Thurston plan. It's guidance. <coughs> the local governments will have to take that plan and go through their own processes to determine what's appropriate for their community. There is no zoning changes imminent. They will be discussed over the next 24 months. And then I asked them, what specifically is your concern? He's a farmer, and he wants to stay farming, but the last time we came down there, we downzoned him from 1 to 5 to 1 to 20. They borrow money to grow crops based on the development potential of their land. They lose the borrowing ability. So these are things that have to be considered when you go down and do this kind of work. So there is kind of a siege, a fatigue mentality down there. The other obstacle with Thurston County is we have legacy zoning. <clears throat> and this legacy zoning is when we said, all right, we're going to adopt the Growth Management Act, but we're going to go 1 to 1, 1 to 5, 2 to 1 in the rural county. So we've got a lot of sprawl that's down there on failing water systems, good water systems, septics that are failing, good septics, and a lot of expectations generated by that population on what they were going to do with their land. Conversely, they've also been dealing with having to drive 15, 20 miles to work with $4 a gallon gas. So you're going to see some opportunities come where people are interested in leaving that kind of environment and perhaps moving into a walkable community, especially as the demographics change and, and we get older. You're going to see people want to discuss more purchase of development rights and transfer development rights. Uh, you're going to see those kinds of things occur. Um, so 
We've got legacy zoning. We've got some fatigue going on. We've got public communications is more important now than it ever has been. You must engage people with facts. You must know what you're talking about. And when you hear misinformation, don't let it stand because it grows. And the next thing you know, you've got a legitimate process you've worked on for a year, two years, it's suddenly sideways. So with that, I think I'll sit down. So thanks for your time tonight. <clears throat>
This is make sure that when people come to Tumwater, they go, wow, what a cool place to be. Uh, improve the transportation system, not just people driving around in trucks and cars, but make sure people can walk safely, that we have interconnected sidewalks and a trail system. Refine and sustain a great organization. This is sort of the nuts and bolts of how the city works. Have a great talent management system so we can make sure we have really awesome employees who can do really good comprehensive planning and fight fires and save lives. Um, provide sufficient quality public safety services. For us, this really was about police and fire. It was some about preparing for emergencies, but it was staffing the North End Fire Station, things like that. And then establishing um, and maintaining good relationships, have good partnerships. Okay? I put those six things up there because one of our tasks as Sustainable Thurston County gets done is to sort of marry those goals and those priorities up with what's in Sustainable Thurston. Okay? And let's sort of like use a street light example. Let's look first for the green lights. Where are the things that we say we need this to happen and Sustainable Thurston proposes these things to happen? And those are the first places that we can move forward because we have alignment of that direction. And then let's look for the yellow lights where maybe we need to tweak a little or clarify a little, but we can get that alignment. And then the red ones are the ones where we're gonna have to do a lot more work. Okay, it's been stressed a couple times in the speakers that this isn't, Sustainable Thurston isn't a mandate. Everyone has to go do this. Okay? Each community is going to have that opportunity to look for the green, the yellow, and the red opportunities and then talk about and work through those. The second, half, the second policy document is indeed the comprehensive plan. And we all have a commitment in 2016 to go back and look at land use and transportation and housing and all of those kinds of things. And, and this is actually very fortuitous, this is a great opportunity for us to use Sustainable Thurston as a way to sort of open the door to the conversation about those elements. Um, we have had elements uh, added to GMA over time as GMA has changed. Um, there are more requirements, more mandates. It can be somewhat daunting to think about updating your comprehensive plan. And in many ways, the Sustainable Thurston work gives us um, the framework to have that conversation about how to do the update. Um, similarly, um, we have, we've actually also been able to integrate um, some of S Sustainable Thurston already in some of the very specific community plans or district plans we have been doing. This is some conversation about corridors. And um, we, the, our piece of the corridor plan has been the brewery neighborhood. It is the area around, not including the brewery, but around the brewery. Similarly, there's one in Lacey, there's one in Olympia. Each of us are doing them differently, but we're doing them with some sort of common concepts that acknowledge what that corridor has meant historically and what it means uh, from a transit and, and uh, transportation standpoint, and then ultimately land use improvements. So I'm talking about some common challenges, uh, things that often show up um, once a plan gets adopted. One is just resources. You know, growth management's the classic example because when growth management passed, there was all sorts of money available and the state was supporting communities. People adopted their comp plans and pretty soon the money to support that just started to decline and decline and it sounds like now we can do an update for 50K. Um, so, you know, how do, how do we mitigate some of that loss of resources that keeps a plan alive? One is try to find an ongoing funding source. You know, one of the problems with a grant system like we've used for GMA is it implies that when when you're done you're done and really when you're done you've just begun you have the challenge of updating it and implementing it and keeping it alive and remaining flexible uh, how do you maintain momentum wow everybody's all excited hundreds of people came to the meeting the elected officials are excited about it the staff is excited won some awards great projects are happening and then just sort of, where, how do you keep that momentum going, okay? One way is you find a champion. Maybe it's an elected official, maybe it's a planning commission member, maybe it's the entire planning commission, maybe it's a particular staff person who continues to be the champion, talk about it, um, celebrate the kinds of things that are being accomplished so that when a new private project comes in, a mixed use project that implements the plan, have a celebration and remind everybody, wow, it was our plan that um, envisioned this. Uh, 
regularly update the plan in response to a problem. Okay? You sort of have to keep reminding everyone what the problem was that you were fixing. Otherwise, you just have a solution sort of hanging out there in limbo. And that sort of need to remind everyone of what the problem was and what generated the plan, what generated the solution, shows up in a number of these. Um, leadership continuity. Uh, one of the great things about democracy is we do not have all the same elected officials forever and ever. Um, there's a fair amount of, of turnover. Um, just speaking from my own community, I have four different elected officials today than I had uh, one and three quarters years ago. Okay? So that, how do you deal with that change um, in terms of um, different people having to learn about what the plan was, why were you doing it, what was the problem? Uh, some solutions include training for all the new leaders. Again, stress the solutions, but also stress what the problems were that got you to those solutions. Um, and then engage those new leaders in the review and the updates. Political support. Uh, keep the outside stakeholders informed and involved through almost every planning process now. There is a significant group of stakeholders um, that have been a part of the process, have been very engaged in it, and helped move, to, move it forward. I know for our brewery neighborhood plan, we have an amazing group of people um, who have met on a regular basis as sort of an advisory task force. Those people are very engaged in the outcome of that plan and wanting it to move forward for a successful business sort of redevelopment area around the brewery. Uh, changing external factors. Uh, what I really mean by this is the we can adopt a plan and the world out there changes. You know? Remember a time when there wasn't the internet. Remember a time when people had fax machines and that was going to save us from all the toil of our office. Uh, because we could just fax things to each other, okay? Anybody remember a zoning code that had trampoline pits in it? There's probably zoning codes that have regulations for video stores, whatever those are. Um, <laughs> those, are those are just examples of how the world changes outside of us, and we have to continue to figure out how to keep things fresh, um, and that really means monitor your plan. Go back and check it. Don't let it sit on the shelf. Um, keep it keep it limber, move back and forth across the room. Uh, new priorities. Um, something new and interesting happening. Uh, maybe we're not as interested in the town center anymore, but now we're interested in a different part of town. So how do we how do we keep that sort of focus <laughs> back or share share the focus? Um, don't just keep the plan in front of people, keep the problems in front of people. I'm emphasizing that but also see how the plan can be adapted to a new particular problem. In other words, let's say there's new community interest in a trail system. It becomes a really big thing for the community to have a trail. Well, is there some way that you could go back into your neighborhood plan and integrate the trail into it? It's a way of keeping the plan fresh, but also bringing a whole new group of stakeholders into the process engaging them in that older plan, refreshing it, and meeting some of their needs also. And then lastly, the sort of dis disconnect between vision and reality. Um, you know, sometimes we set really high goals. And at some point, we have to sit down and say, can we really do that? And if we can't, then maybe we need to go back in and tweak that goal or adjust it and sort of look at, so what could a new reality look like? It's good to have aggressive goals, but if you can't ever get to them, um, then it can be a little problematic. So, so that's one way, again, to keep the plan fresh um, and do those kinds of things. So that is all I have. So I will turn it back. Thank you very much.